All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. Welcome, and welcome to those who are tuning in online. If you're with House Church or you're just with your family, whatever you're doing, good to see you. Um, if you guys want to stand up, let's prepare our hearts for our worship service. All right, you guys read the bold words. Come with what you have. For you who grieve this day know that you are invited to bring the broken pieces of your heart. Come with what you have, for you who come with gladness know that your melody will find harmony. Accepting God's love for us, we are called to love one another. Come with what you have, for you weighed down by too many shoulds and what ifs, know that here you may lay down the burden of guilt and shame. Come with what you have. For you who come seeking know that your questions are safe in the presence of God. Love by one another. We discover God's love for us. Come with what you have. And together let's offer praise and worship to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen.
Grab a seat. All right, welcome to Crossroads. My name is Joe, lead pastor here. If you're visiting with us online, special welcome. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Got a couple announcements and your thoughts. So if there's something you want to hear, a Bible book, you're like, I never understood this, or that thing in the Bible always confuses me. Throw that in, you know, let us know. People have been putting suggestions on Facebook. I've gotten some through email. So again, you can shoot it to me at joeatcrossroads.net and we will put your ideas into the upcoming messages. And then as we take our offering, if you're visiting with us online, just thanks for hanging out with us. Feel uh, no obligation to participate in this part of our service. You can give online. You can give um, through the app. Or a lot of people just, um, you know, write out uh, their offerings and then put it in, in the mail and drop that in. There's a box in the back of the room for those of you in the room. But we reflect on the words of Scripture. I'm going to do it quickly today because we're going to get into this cheerfully, regularly, proportionally, sacrificially in the message. But each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under pressure, for God loves the cheerful giver. We want to give out of a place of thanksgiving in our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls, thanking God for what he's given us and how he's blessed us. And so that's what we're going to dive into the message today. So now I'm going to invite you to stand up and let's lift our voices and praise our God.
Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you and we hail you. We recognize your grace, your goodness, your beauty, your wisdom and your way. And that's all I want us to hear this morning, your wisdom and your way. So if my words get in the way, just let them go away. So your light would shine in this time and place. In Jesus' holy name we pray and all God's people said, amen. You can grab a seat. Well, we continue on in this series of 2 Corinthians. We're going to come to chapter 8 uh, today, and I want to take us back to where we were last week. At the end of last week's message, I had this letter from a guy by the name of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a very important figure in church history. He lived like 500 years ago. And when he was alive 500 years ago, as the world does from time to time, it goes through pandemics, and it was going through this pandemic. It was a complete mess. And he talked about, I won't give you the whole letter this week. I gave it to you last week. But just this line, at least I have done what he gave me to do. As he was reflecting on what do I do as a leader, as a pastor, as a Christian leader in the midst of a pandemic, and he came up with all these things. And then he said, at least I have done what he gave me to do. This is a really important idea, giving, right, doing what God has given us to do. I think a page coming up, and she's learning, right, she's an adult, entering adulthood, and she's being molded and shaped, as all these college students are, right, into the person that God has created them to be. And, and that question of, what has God given me to do, is a really important one. And, it, and when we grab onto it and when we understand it and we live into it, right, it can be the greatest, it can be the greatest thing in the world. And as, when I think of this, <laughs> this idea of, you know, God giving us something to do, so often, my life, your life, probably all our lives is, we don't do what God has given us to do. We want to do all sorts of other things and we miss what God has given us to do. And the moment, the moment in my life that really, the story of my, in my life that always drives us home when I, whenever I get off track. I'm like, okay, what is mine to do? I got to go back to, to I, I didn't play football long growing up. I only played two years. I was very small and scrawny, but my buddies, my two good buddies growing up, Dave, uh, um, Dan and Kev, I put their names together there. I, I, Dave's my good buddy now. <laughs> Dan and Kev, um, they were bigger than me, better athletes than I, than I was, and they were going to play on the football team. And I wanted to play on the football team because my buddies were playing on the football team. And I love football, and I love playing football in the neighborhood. But when you're on an organized team, now it's a little different. And I'm literally the smallest guy on the team, which, you know, in football, this is not a good thing. You, you want to be bigger, right? So... <laughs> so freshman year of high school, this was my second, I played in eighth grade, I played freshman year of high school. Freshman year, I played at a place called Austin Catholic Preparatory School, which closed at the end of the year for declining enrollment, right? There just weren't that many kids at the school. So our football team wasn't that good. In fact, I don't think we won a game all year because we were the small school who hardly had anybody and on the small school who hardly had anybody I was by far the tiniest kid so the coaches are cool though the coaches are nice they want you to have fun your kid okay what are we gonna do with Muzzy what what can he do on the team so they put me on kickoff kickoff where you on where you go and tackle the guy kickoff Okay, not, not the return, but kickoff. So, and the way they did it was, you know, you, f you figure it out. Basically, they take a good guy, then they put me. Then they put another good guy, then they put another bad guy, right? Then they put another good guy. On kickoff, they can take the guys who aren't that good or are too small, that shouldn't even be out there playing football, me, and you put them in between. So on kickoff, all you're supposed to do is stay in your lane, do your part that the coach has given you to do. The part that the coach has given you to do is stay in this lane. Everybody runs down the field. You stay in your lanes, and you don't give the ball carrier any place to go. Okay, but now it's the 
first game of the year. And the other team wins the coin toss, so we're going to kick off to them. So it's the first game, the first play. The part that's been given me to do on, on the kickoff is simply to stay in my lane and run down the field. But I've got a better idea. I'm thinking, for first play of the season, I'm going to fire my team up. Instead of trying to go around the blocker, I'm going to run directly at him. I'm going to go as fast as I can, and I'm going to run right into him, and I'm going to knock him down, and I'm going to fire my team up. So, so the ball gets kicked, it goes into the air, and I run as fast as I can. I run directly into the guy in front of me who's I'm supposed to run around, right? I just run directly into him, bam. He doesn't move. I, I go flying backward. He's probably got 30, 40 pounds on me. I don't know why I thought I could knock him over, right? So, so I go flying backwards. I'm looking up at the sky on my back, and the play rushes down past me, and I jump up, and I run off the field. Because I didn't do what God had given me to do. I had a great idea. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And you know, what God has for us to do is kind of simple. And we can make it really hard and we can make it really complicated. So as we, we continue on in this series, this holy exchange, today we really want to talk about how we do what God has called us to do. And so the holy exchange works like this, right? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is God's character. It's God's goodness. It's God's grace. And so one thing we can say about God's goodness and grace, God's righteousness, is that God is generous. And so God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God is generous, we're called to be generous. And it's important to realize that God's generosity is just given freely and given out of a place of freedom. It's, it's not given out of a place of need in God. One writer says it like this. God did not create to satisfy any inadequacy or need of his own, but out of the fullness of his love, joy, and delight. And so this love, joy, and delight are given to creatures as generosity and return to God as thanksgiving and praise. As God gives to us, then we give back. As God gives love to us freely, then the part he gives to us is, then you give that back freely. Then you're my generosity in this world. You're my love in this world. Paul says it like this to the uh, people in Rome. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That we offer our lives back. It's, it's like God's love doesn't stop with us. We're like the conduit. I have blessed you. You will be a blessing. I give to you, and out you go giving. And so we're going to take a look now at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And, and Paul's encouragement to the Corinthians in this passage is this. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Now, I'm, now that's 15 verses. I'm, what we're going to do today is I'm going to read all 15, and then we're going to come back, and I'm going I'm to break, break them down. But as I'm reading them, think about what we say every week. How do we give? We give cheerfully, regularly, proportionally, sacrificially. So as I'm reading these verses, you're going to find all four of those things. You're going to hear cheerfully. You're going to hear regularly. You're going to hear proportionally. You're going to hear sacrificially. So let's hear, what Paul has, let's hear what Paul has for the Corinthians. Just the little background. I'll explain this a little bit more in a second. 
he's encouraging them. He's encouraging the people of Corinth to give some money to, for an offering that's being taken for people who are struggling in the town of Jerusalem. Okay? So, and here, here he goes. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. These are the words of our God and King, and we are thankful for them, for in them we find true and everlasting life. And these speak to us about what a true and everlasting life looks like, right? So first, let's talk about these Macedonian churches, just so that we can see. I'll show you in the room... If you're watching on the live stream, see the part that's outlined in red here, where it's outlined in red, that's Macedonia, and they're sending all the way to Jerusalem. And sometimes, like, when we do things like go to Ecuador, people say, why would you, why would you go to Ecuador? Well, because the church has been doing this as long as there's been a church. The, and we didn't go to Ecuador this year. We were going to go um, to Ecuador, and then the borders were closed for Ecuador closed their border first, uh, actually. And so we didn't, we didn't get that opportunity to go. But we did still send an offering down to the church that we were going down to help. We were going to help a church expand their uh, worship space. And we are going to go hang out with them, worship together with them. So this is what the church does. We help, we help uh, people in need. And we help people in need all over the world. So... So that's what they're doing. Oh, there we go. Now notice the first one cheerfully. Now look at, I love this equation. <laughs> Just add this all up. Okay. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. They're in the midst of a trial. They're extremely impoverished. But you sprinkle in the joy of the Lord. You sprinkle in God's love. And suddenly these people, right, are rich in generosity. That's God. That's beautiful. And this is, we were putting this together. Our associate pastor Dave says, how do you, because, you know, we're looking at the series coming up, and we know that chapter 8 and chapter 9 are in 2 Corinthians. And Dave's question was, 
how do you preach generosity to a generous church? Like, this is a generous church. You're generous people. You, you do what Paul's encouraging the Corinthians to do. I'm going to give you the example, right? In the midst of a very severe trial, I, I'm going to call it, <laughs> since in my 57 years kicking around on the planet, this is the craziest time I've ever been through. The, mo the, the highest unemployment, the craziest uh, environment, the craziest everything. In the midst of a very severe trial, if I stood up in front of you this morning and I said, you know, we're in the midst of a, a severe trial and the offerings of the church have gone down 20%, but that's okay. We're in the midst of a severe trial. Don't worry about it. Like, that's, that's to be expected. But the offerings of this church have not gone down 20%. They haven't gone down 10%. They haven't gone down 5%. They haven't gone down at all. The offerings of this church have actually increased in the midst of a very severe trial. They've gone up. Last year, 2019, I think, I would have to go back, but I'm pretty sure 2019 was our best year ever. And our offerings this year are 6% higher than they were last year in the midst of a very severe trial where unemployment basically tripled or quadrupled from where it was last year and the offerings went up. How is that possible? Because you guys are generous. Because you understand right? Cheerfully, regularly, proportionally, sacrificially. In the midst, I let, it's, it doesn't equate. If, it's, if God isn't in this equation, it doesn't work. They've got a severe trial. They've got extreme poverty. And suddenly they throw in the overflowing joy of the Lord and rich generosity goes forward. So like in the last year, so regular offerings have gone up. Uh, the money that you've contributed to renew, relate, reach out, right? Like, that keeps flowing in. So in the last year, this church has given $4,000 for new churches to be planted in the midst of this crazy trial, to send $1,000 down to Ecuador, which will actually go way farther than that 4000 will go for church planting in the United States because $1,000 goes a very long way in, in Ecuador. And, and people just... And, and Renewed Hope Counseling Center keeps going because of your guys' faithfulness. So, so all I want to say, so Dave's question to me, how, do we, how are we going to preach this? How are we going to do this? These, they're already generous. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your consistency. Thank you for how you help out. Thank, thank, thanks that you get it and that the work of the church goes forward in the midst of a very severe trial. You make that happen. And so that we start with the cheerfully, and then we go to sacrificially, and of course we're following Jesus Christ. He made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus had it all, and he willingly laid it down. And we get that. When we become the righteousness of God, we say, wait, this isn't for me. This is for me to use, to give out, to help out. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So we give sacrificially, and you guys do give sacrificially. And then regularly, again... <laughs> I, I can look, and from, from the day that we were all started staying home in, in mid-March, literally not one week did the offerings miss a beat. It wasn't like it's, it took people three to four weeks to figure out, oh, hey, maybe we should start sending our checks, and people just did it automatically. <laughs> people just pitched in automatically. 
So again, thank you. And then, proportionally, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. What we've got to believe, what I didn't believe on that football field all those years ago, was just doing my little part was all I had to do. I wanted to do the big part. I wanted to make the big splash. I wanted to do the whole thing. But I was just called to do one thing. And, and, and the important thing for us as Christians is what is the one thing? What is my part? What is the one thing that God is calling me to do? Right? And so we bring that. And then we get God's economics. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but there might be equality so that you help out when somebody else is having a hard time, then you get help when you're having a hard time. And we've seen this lived out over the last 15 years, right? We had a time where we, we were doing well and we, we gave a substantial amount of money so that City Covenant Church could get started. And then literally... A couple, two, three years after that, in the midst of the Great Recession and the economy's in the toilet, and now we're struggling, and the church, the denomination, you know, the bigger church came alongside us and helped us through that. And now in this current crisis, we're in a season where we're doing okay. So we're, we're helping out. We're sending that money to Ecuador. We're sending that money to the church plants. And that's, that's how it works with God. So, so this, doing the part God has assigned to you, it, it's worth figuring out what that is, and then it's worth doing it, because there's no better feeling. So, so let me, so I can give you the highlights of my football career, because there's really only one, Okay. And, and I never, you know, I never advanced beyond the, beyond the kickoff team because that's all they had for me to do. That was my part, though. And I should say, though, the other part of my part, my buddy Dan was on the field all the time. My buddy Kev was on the field all the time. And I cheered them on, and I hooped and hollered when they made good plays, right? I mean, that was part of my part. But so here I am. I learned my lesson first play of the year. Just run down your lane. Right? Don't try to knock over people who are twice your size. Just do your part. So here I am, running down my lane. And everybody else is running down their lane. And I'm looking, and I, and I see the ball carrier, has, he's got nowhere else on the field to go. The only way for him to advance the ball is to run over me. Because I've stayed in my lane. I'm right there. So, as he's running over me, right, I, and I'm falling backwards, as I remember it, I think I just like grabbed, right, and I landed on my back. Or it's either, it was either that or basically as he knocked me over, he tripped over me trying to get by. One or the other, that's a tackle. And that was a tackle that I made, little me. I swear, if I was 80 pounds, I, I might not even have been 80 pounds, right? Little, and, and the kid, you know, he's a big kid. He's ball carriers bringing it back. I jumped up. I was so happy. I was so proud. I was hooping and hollering. I had made a tackle. And to this day, I have made a tackle <laughs> but you see like when we do the part that God has given us that's why you can do it cheerfully because it's so much fun right we think you know the fun is when we get the fun is when we give and God's love goes out into the world and God's goodness goes out into the world so what part has God assigned to you Right? Oh, I'm going quickly over that because I didn't leave enough time for that. So will we all continue? Will we all, and I put continue in all caps. Will we all continue to do our part? The part that God has given to us. 
In order to continue to do the part God has given us, some of us will have to put down our Slurpees. What is that, a Slurpee? <laughs> All right. So the music people are here. They were, t- you know, they, no, you're fine. You're fine. They, uh, they did their part at the 930, and they were just getting, you know, a little refreshment to get them through to the end. So here we go. All right. So, but think about this. It's important that we think about this. First of all, if you're doing your part, as I know so many of you are, so many of you are, thank you. It makes a difference, and the work of the church goes forward because of your generosity. But I always ask the question, what's, what part does God have for me now, this moment, right? And then you bring that. You bring that. And and as the song says, then God makes the way. In the midst of their severe trial and their extreme poverty, God still makes a way. So let's, let's rise, let's lift our voices and praise our God.
that good and giving God blesses you. May he bless you and keep you. And then may you take it and do your part so that God's love will go out into this world. Have a great week, everybody.